I'm a 28-year-old male, but when this happened, I was about 23. I worked at a mom-and-pop's pizza shop in a place in Northern California. It's a small farm town and has a few suburbs near it. I kind of did everything since I knew the family. They trusted me with running things while they were gone. This night, though, I was working deliveries and got the weirdest one of my life. Everything seemed fine when I took the order. The lady ordered anchovies on her pizza, and I always think people who order that are weird as shit. She made a point to tell me the pizza had to be hot when it got there, or she wouldn't pay for it. So I get the pizza and throw it in the warmer, and drive to her house before any of my other deliveries. I'd like to tell you guys that her house was creepy and run down, but it looks like your average one-story new housing development home. I rang the doorbell and put on my fake-ass customer service smile. You all know what I'm talking about. And as soon as she opens the door, I knew this was going to be bad. The haggard old lady who looked like she was a smoker of 50 plus years looked me dead in the eyes and said, It had better be hot, or I'm not paying like I told you over the damn phone. I understand, ma'am. I made sure to stop by your place first, even though it was last on my list bring it in and set it on the table. She said this, and now, I don't normally go inside customers' homes because I read too many stories on no sleep and let's not meet, but at this point I'm just wanting to kill her with kindness and see where this will go. So I say, no problem, I also brought cheese and ranch for you if you need it. As soon as I opened the bag, she grabbed the box, and her hand was on the bottom of it just rubbing it. It's not hot enough. You fuckers do this every time, and I'm not paying for this shit. Not a single dime. One thing I have an issue with is my mouth. I don't know when to just shut up and try to understand where people are coming from. Look, lady, your house is a five-minute drive from our shop, and I stopped by your place first. There's no way your pizza is cold. If you refuse to pay, you're going to be 86 and I'll notate it on your account. She immediately walked into her kitchen and came back out. She had an old pizza from a few weeks prior she had ordered from us, and threw it at me. Take your fucking pizza and get out of my house. You're the devil. She yelled that at me and kept calling me Satan and the devil. Again, my mouth has no filter and I can't control it. I try, but I fail every time. As I'm closing the bag and laughing about how much I hate my job, I tell her, all right, ma'am. You will not be able to order pizza from us again. I hope you have a good day, and God bless you and your house. She kept following me outside to my car, screaming about how I was the fucking devil. And there are families out there just watching this all go down. I get in my car and start driving. Once I'm back, I tell my manager what happened, and she told me that the lady had already called in and screamed to her about what had gone down. Her story was that I cussed her out and got her order wrong. My manager shut her down and said I'd never do anything like that. But here's the weird part. She whispered into the phone to my manager and repeated, Send him back. Send him back. Send him back. She called once a day for almost three months, just whispering this to whoever answered. She started driving by the restaurant and yelling, The devil works here. You're all going to hell. Now, I wasn't scared. I was just pissed and wanted to retaliate, because I can't tell you how many times she tried to follow me back to my apartment when I got off work. One night, I pulled over and got out just for her to stop her car in the road with her lights on, yelling, The devil is here. After this, I jumped back in my car and sped off. Luckily, after six months of dealing with this lady, I found out she was schizophrenic and bipolar and hadn't been on her meds. Her daughter put her in a care home, but when she was cleaning out her house, she saw that her mom had pictures of me all over her bedroom wall with the word, yep, you guessed it, devil, scrawled all over it. She found me and explained everything to me, and thankfully, that was the end of it all. One evening when I was in my junior year of high school, my mom and dad went out, leaving me home alone. I had a lot of homework to do, so I spent the whole evening sitting at a desk in my bedroom. 
My parents left the house around 6 p.m. When I was doing my homework, I put on my headphones and I listened to loud music. There was a big storm that night and my desk was facing the window so I could see the rain and the lightning outside. My parents got back around 11 p.m. When I saw their car drive up, I took off the headphones. As soon as my mom opened the front door and came inside, I heard her shout out my name. What on earth happened in here? She demanded in an angry voice. Confused, I ran downstairs. My mom was standing in the hallway with a furious look on her face. She pointed at the floor and yelled, was this you? I looked down and I saw that the carpet was covered in muddy footprints. I have no idea how those got there, I said. I spent the whole night at my desk doing my homework. I watched as the look on her face change from anger to confusion and then to fear. We both realized at the same time that someone else must have been in the house. We followed the trail of footprints, trying to make sense of the whole situation. They started at the back door, which we usually left unlocked. Then we noticed something else. The footprints started at the back door, but there was no trail of footprints leaving through the back door. All of a sudden, we hear something loud, a pounding noise that echoed throughout the house. Then the sound of the front door being wrenched open and slammed shut again. We all ran into the garage and locked the door behind us. My mom took out her cell phone and called the police. She told them to come quickly as she shouted that someone's in our house. After what seemed like hours, a patrol car arrived with two police officers, a male and a female. One officer stayed with us in the garage while his partner went through the house, searching room by room. When she came back, the female officer told us that there was no one in the house and it was safe to go back in. As we were all breathing a high sigh of relief, she asked, whose bedroom is upstairs on the left? My parents looked at me. It's mine, I told the officer. She asked us to follow her. As we walked through the house, we could see the trail of muddy footprints leading from the back door through the living room, through the hallway, up the stairs, into my parents' bedroom, then towards my room. They stopped at my doorway. The female officer pointed at my door, which had been open the whole night. Scrawled on it in black marker was the following. 847, I see you. 853, you forgot to lock the back door. 859, you seem focused. 924, turn around. 947, look at me. 1015, look at me. 1037, look at me. 1049, look at me. For more than two hours, someone had been standing in my doorway, watching me. To this day, I still shudder to think what would have happened if I had just turned around. When I was 16 years old, I was at a very low point in my life, and I ended up getting hospitalized for four months over the summer. The doctors were afraid that my heart would give out if I did so much as walk, so if I wanted to go anywhere, I had to call a nurse to take me in a wheelchair. My mum and dad visited me every day, not always together. Whenever my mum came alone, she would take me out in a wheelchair to the beach access behind the hospital so I could get some fresh air and look at the lake. One day, my mum had come by to visit, and she took me out to the beach as usual. While we were waiting for the elevator down from the ward, a man stopped my mum and me. Your daughter has such beautiful black hair. The way he said it gave me chills, kind of in a Buffalo Bill-esque, I want to wear it kind of way. My mum thanked him and chatted a bit, but I just looked the other way and ignored him. I could feel his eyes on me though. We all pile into the elevator, 
and as soon as the doors close, I feel something tugging at my hair. I glance over, and I realize that the guy is playing with my hair. I'm pretty creeped out here, but I don't want to cause a scene just in case he has a mental disorder and can't help himself. So I just leaned over as far as I could in my wheelchair, so that he couldn't reach me without alerting my mum. Anyway, we reach the bottom, get off, and my mum and I start wheeling over to the beach, while the guy just stands there by the elevator and watches us go. I told my mum what he did, and she said that she would make sure to do something if we ever saw him again. After that, we kept seeing him, always by the elevator. He'd make a comment about how beautiful my hair is, and my mum would nod politely. We'd get inside the elevator and he'd try play with my hair, but my mum would move in the way so that he wouldn't be able to. We'd get off and he'd just watch us roll out. This happened quite frequently. It was creepy, but we decided he was harmless. That was until about a month later. We went down to the beach as usual, and this time we didn't see him at the elevator, but we didn't think much of it. At some point, my mum had to use the restroom, and it was mutually decided I was old enough to take care of myself for three minutes. I was sitting in my wheelchair, looking out over at the lake and enjoying the sun, when I started getting pushed. Thinking it was my mum, I turned around to ask for five more minutes, but no. It wasn't my mum. It's the fucking guy. He's pushing me towards the bushes, and the look on his face is predatory. I scream, but the only other people out there are in the canoe in the water. They can't hear a thing. So I make a decision. I decide if I'm going to die. I'd rather it be a part failure than by this dude's hand. So I get up out of the wheelchair and I start sprinting towards the restrooms. I look behind me to see if he's following, and fortunately, he's not. He's just standing by the wheelchair, looking shocked. I guess he thought I was paralyzed. I make it back to my mum, who ran out of the toilet as soon as she heard me screaming. We both look back and the guy is running away like there's a rocket up his ass. My mum carried me on her back to the wheelchair, and then we rushed to inform the hospital staff. They put a watch out, and for the next few months, there's security hanging around the elevator on my floor. But he never came back. Last year I went to the dentist to get my upper left wisdom tooth removed. I thought they'd offer me general anesthesia, where I'd go to sleep and wake up and it would be done. But instead I was told that I would have to have the twilight option, which is where you get the needle in the arm. You're a bit groggy, but unaware of your surroundings and not fully asleep. Now I'm not totally sure why I had to have this option, but it was something to do with how complicated the surgery was. I figured as long as I didn't feel any pain, it wouldn't matter. And I wasn't nervous at all as I didn't really read up on what was involved. But my friend Damon gave me a ride and then he was going to swing by and pick me up after. They injected me and I felt a little dizzy. They applied some gel to my mouth and lowered me into the chair. It was a strange sensation. I couldn't feel my hands or my feet, but I had an incredible itch on my nose. God, I wanted to say something, but realized then I couldn't say anything. It was absolute torture real quick. The dental assistant pressed down hard on my tongue. The pressure really hurt. Then I felt a sharp stabbing pain into my gums. It was excruciating. She turned to the dentist and assured him that I wasn't feeling anything. But I was. I tried to speak. I, I tried to tell her that I was feeling every single time she stuck her instrument into my mouth. But I couldn't. 
I heard the sound of a drill and then a saw and then another needle and I felt a jab into the interior of my cheeks as the dentist poked around. It was the worst pain I'd ever felt. And then, and then there was this, this crunching sound. It was so loud. And the scraping, the scraping as he literally ripped out my tooth. Now my nerves were so shot at this point, but as each time he touched a tooth, a sharp pain would strike through my brain. And as he retracted his scalpel and the instrument that carried the tooth, it somehow slipped and he dropped it. Now I felt it wedge in my throat. He didn't realize it at first. He was talking about his future vacation or something. My tooth was in my throat and I could feel myself choking on it. And yet there was nothing I could do. I tried blinking rapidly, but never saw a blink happen once. It was, it was like my brain knew something that was happening, but my body and my brain w were just disconnected. When the dental assistant asked for the tooth, the dentist joked that he might have dropped it. And she looked around outside of my mouth, not even thinking that it was inside. I could feel my windpipe closing and fluid building up. I felt like I was drowning. I was begging for help, begging for her to save me. She stuck a suction pipe into my throat and it cleared some of the clot. But I guess I, I somehow swallowed it. And I pushed my tooth further into my throat, jamming it in there. Now I was telling myself, breathe through your nose, breathe through your nose. But I just felt it getting hotter and hotter. It was like I was in an oven. And then she panicked. I heard them say that I was choking. At which point I could no longer breathe. I vaguely remember falling out of the chair and hitting the floor. And then being spun over and, and then just blacking out. When I came to, I learned the assistant had performed a tracheotomy on me. She had cut a hole in my throat so I'd have an airway to breathe. Now have you ever seen one of those commercials where people have smoked for too long and they have a hole in their neck? That's me now. The next time I have a toothache, I'm going to take a hammer and smash it out. It'll be less painful. I do admit this story has a very fine line between bizarre and abusive, but overall it's the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. In all honesty, I've had a lot of creepy encounters, known a lot of normal people that ended up doing very bad things. Sometimes I almost feel like I'm cursed to make friends with rough edges. And this whole situation started when I was a sophomore in high school. I showed up to school one day and noticed a new boy in my class. I was your atypical goth girl, and this guy was a teenage bad boy dream. Piercings, leather jacket, reading some sort of obscure novel. I was hooked at first sight. I introduced myself and soon enough we were dating. He will henceforth be referred to as X for the rest of the story. Now for a little background. I was brought up in an alcoholic parent's home. There were many times I was living by myself or with a friend because one of my parents was in the hospital. Despite the chaos in my family life, I still managed to go to school every day and pull in decent enough grades. After one time too many, however, I was left for two plus months living alone. Instead of coming home to an empty house, I asked X if I could live with him since he was closer to school. He and his parents happily welcomed me into their home. At this point in the relationship, maybe five months in, we were phasing out of the puppy love stage and I was starting to notice some very serious red flags. X was very mental and started cutting regularly. His parents were very heavy drug users. There would be times I would try talking to X and he would literally stare off into space and not notice my existence. He was never mean or abusive towards me, but I could definitely tell something was unhooking in him. When we started living together, it started to become very evident something was very, very wrong. He started to tell me he thought he was possessed by demons and couldn't control himself. When we both spiraled into moderate drug use, I started skipping school, and he started seeing more of these demons. 
In all truth, I hadn't realized what a hole I had dug myself into by living with him. One night, we ended up falling asleep after smoking a bowl and watching a movie. It was a big house, and we were living in the garden level basement, two or so floors below his parents and siblings. Around midnight, I was woken up by the most frightening screech I'd ever heard. X was right next to me in bed, contorting, convulsing, and screaming bloody murder. At first, I thought it was just a seizure. I've seen friends have seizures before, and I didn't interfere, only looking for one of our cell phones to call 911. As I got up out of the bed, he looked me dead in the eyes. The blood drained from my veins. I've never seen such hate. Everything seemed to happen in flashes from there. He never broke eye contact as he slowly rose from the bed. It almost looked as if he was a marionette on a set of strings, pulled up with sunken shoulders. A half-smile formed on his face as his body twitched. He started walking towards me. I can't describe how terrified I was, cornered in the room, opposite to the door. I felt my ears swell and ring. He started screeching at me, coming within a centimeter of my face, never breaking his gaze. I started pushing him, yelling at him to cut it out, but it was like trying to push away a stone statue. He would not move. He finally started talking, ranting about the demon and not making a single word of sense. As bizarre as it was, I knew he was having some sort of mental episode. I truly did fear for my life and knew I needed to escape. Suddenly, I felt as if I was sucked back into the moment, and my senses were incredibly acute. I noticed the window we had cracked open earlier. I pushed the window back, punched through the screen, and climbed out as he stood silently staring after me. I'm pretty sure I stayed outside for an hour, hyperventilating before I decided to ring the doorbell. One of his parents answered, very confused, and set me up with a blanket on the couch on the first floor with no questions asked. In the morning, X came up and acted as if nothing had happened, no matter how much I pestered him about it. It was as if it had all been a bad dream. I made arrangements to stay with another friend that day, and broke up with X about a week after, once I was actually able to face him again. Sometimes, I wonder if it had been some sort of sick joke to get me out of his house or out of the relationship, but I watched unshocked in the years after, as he fell into severe drug abuse and mental illness. At one point, I went to a school counselor and told them how worried I was for him, but it only made him hold a grudge against me. After everything that happened, I really started to feel sorry for him, and sort of weirdly forgave him for what he did. He tried contacting me a few times after everything that happened, but as the years went by, I heard less and less. Last I heard, he was addicted to meth and living on the streets. When I was 20 years old and my brother was 15, our parents were out of town. My brother had some friends over one night. As I walked out of the door to pick up food, I overheard them talking about the supernatural. What I didn't know was one of them had brought over a spirit board. While I was gone, they decided to call on the spirit. After a few times of asking for a spirit to appear to them, they got their wish. The lights in the house went out. A low, eerie laugh consumed the whole house, and not one of the seven could move. They all say they could see a shadow circling the table, but the light from the neighbor's house was dense. All of them knew they should run, yet they couldn't even move a finger. No one could speak scream or cry. As I pulled into the driveway, the seven teenagers came running out in the house screaming and crying. They reached me quickly, but as they were running to me, I saw the blinds in the living room pull apart in the middle aggressively. Before I could process what I had seen, all of them were trying to tell me what had just happened. The front door suddenly slammed, knocking the already torn blind to the floor. Although you think that it would be the end of the story, but it's not. Someone still had to go back in the house, or at least lock the door. The 17s weren't an option, and I was the only adult in sight. I had my brother go with me since this is partly his fault. We walked to the front door slowly, but both of us were breathing hard and I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. As I put my fingers on the handle of the door, 
I thought about it like ripping off a band-aid. Just do it fast. I slung the door open with one swoop. The smell was unimaginable, and it hit us like a slap in the face. The odor was a mixture of flowers and something rotten. It took us a moment to overcome the horrific smell. Before entering the house, I tried to turn on the lights by the door. The outside light and the hall light turned on right away. I shouldn't have been surprised to see that the house was in shambles if I hadn't seen the blind rip open or see the door slam on its own. I would have thought my brother had entertained a wild party. As we entered the house, I began telling the entity in a loud, demanding voice, leave this home. You're not welcome here. As I spoke, I walked to where the spirit board was on the floor. When I picked up the board, I said, this conversation has ended. Goodbye. The front door slammed on its own again, but the odor was gone. We cleaned up, and honestly, we never told my parents. In 2011, on my 21st birthday, I took it upon myself to go backpacking through the Canadian mountains all on my own. I had gone backpacking and camping many times before, but never on my own. I wanted this birthday's significance to be rooted in the fact that I had challenged the great outdoors all on my own. On my third day out, I reached my destination. It was an old farmhouse sitting on its own in an overgrown field, out in the middle of nowhere. I had discovered it on Google Earth, and was eager to check it out before heading back. In addition to a first aid kit, a compass, and a utility knife, I was carrying a Smith & Wesson Governor revolver, which carried six shots. It was the crown jewel of my father's collection, and he had loaned it to me for protection while I was out in the woods alone. He made sure that I had practiced with it several times, and knew how to use it before I set off. And now, as I approached the farmhouse, I was pleased that I had taken the time, because I wasn't entirely sure the place was abandoned. Every window on the ground floor was boarded up, and a faded plastic pinwheel spun lazily from where it was stuffed into the dirt by the front door. I walked right up the front steps, and feeling somewhat foolish, I knocked. When no one answered, I walked around the perimeter of the house. There was an ancient rusty fire escape hanging down from one of the upstairs windows and an old single door refrigerator lying on its side out amongst the tall grass. When I walked back around to the front door of the house again, I tried the knob. It was rusty, but I managed to turn it with both hands and the door swung open with a creak. I was just about to walk in, when I felt the sensation of eyes on me, and I spun around. Out by the tree line, I saw what appeared to be a man with a long gray beard staring at me. I immediately felt foolish and guilty, and waved at him, my other hand reaching into my belt to rest on the handle of the gun. Hi there, is this your place? I'm sorry, I'll leave. For maybe ten seconds the man just stared at me. Then, without saying anything, he turned and walked back into the trees. That made me nervous. I didn't know how to interpret it, and the last thing I wanted to do was walk back into the woods knowing that he was out there. I decided to enter the house and close the door behind me. I slid a dusty stool in front of the door, so I would hear it tip over if anyone entered. I spent the next hour exploring the house, occasionally glancing out of the windows to see if the man had reappeared. When it finally began getting dark out, I was still nervous and unwilling to leave the house, so I walked up a narrow flight of stairs to the attic, locked the door behind me, set up my gas lantern, and unrolled my sleeping bag. After a light dinner, I updated my journal, turned off the light, and prepared to get some sleep. But after a minute or so, I heard creaking on the stairs, and my eyes shot open. I looked over towards the door and I heard the faint sound of footsteps climbing the narrow staircase. I threw myself out of the sleeping bag, grabbed my flashlight and my gun, and pointed them both towards the door. I called out, Who's there? If I'm trespassing, I'm sorry. I'll pack up and leave. Just don't try to open the door. I have a gun. The footsteps continued to climb without hesitation. When they were just outside the door, I heard the doorknob rattle. I made my voice sound as furious as I could. Don't try to get in. I told you I have a gun. 
Just tell me who you are. There was a moment of hesitation, and then the doorknob began to jiggle harder. Stop it. I'll fucking shoot. I made myself count to five, but the doorknob continued to jiggle violently. Last chance. I made myself count to five again, and when the jiggling didn't stop, I fired two shots through the door, aiming low, intending to hit the stranger's legs. As soon as the shots rang out, the knob stopped jiggling, and there was silence. There was no sound of anyone falling backwards down the steps or a gasp in pain. There was just silence. I kept the gun up and cautiously walked towards the door. I unlocked it and opened it. I nearly shat myself when I saw there was nothing standing there. There was no blood, no body, no indication that anyone had been standing there. I slammed the door, locked it again, and dragged an ancient rusty armchair in front of the door to block it. For the next several hours, I would doze off for a while and then wake up again, keeping my gun nearby until the sun rose. After it was light enough, I gathered my belongings and crawled out of the window and went down the fire escape. But when I was about 20 steps away from the house, I turned, and looking back at me from the attic window was the bearded old man. I drew my gun and aimed it at him, but I didn't shoot. I did it as a warning not to follow me. Then I sprinted back into the woods. Two years later in the summer of 2013, I returned to the house with four of my friends and showed them all the bullet holes in the attic door. I still go camping every now and then, but I always make sure I bring my handgun, because you never know who might be watching you from the shadows. I'm 23 years old, and as a child, my family and I would spend all three months of summer at my grandpa's huge farmhouse in Tirana, Albania, which is around seven miles from the nearest town. Apart from an old computer, my grandparents have a complete lack of recent technology, so I often found myself exploring woods, taking long relaxing walks which I liked because it gave me time to think, and a lot of the time I went hunting with my dad and grandpa in search of coyotes and foxes which would kill our livestock. Just to be more clear, I'd been taught to shoot for years at this point, and I found myself to be quite a good shot. One particular day, it was around 1pm. Bored out of my mind, I decided to take my grandpa's two German shepherds for a walk. Eventually we got to one of my favourite places, a crystal clear river, around seven foot wide. Walking, I noticed a tall man on the other side of the river, with his back turned to me. He was wearing a pair of black jeans and a hoodie, which I found odd considering it's around 80 degrees this time of year. Even more concerning is that there's usually nobody around for at least a few miles. Despite this, I spoke to him, and asked if he was lost, or if he needed any directions. He ignored me completely, not even acknowledging I was there. I continued to walk, and had eventually made some distance from this person. Then I heard him crossing the river, and come across to the side I was standing on. I turned around to see him, just standing there, with his eyes wide open, almost as if he was surprised to see me. Trying not to think much of this, I continued walking, only to notice that he was following me at a slightly faster pace. I turned around and said, Do you want something, sir? I said this in confidence, simply because I had my grandpa's two dogs with me. He began to walk much faster towards me. Now I was genuinely scared. I knew nothing of this man, who he was, what he wanted, if he was armed, so I ran. To avoid leading him directly to my grandpa's farmhouse, I cut through a small woodland, at which point I thought I'd lost him and continued to make my way back home. I spoke nothing of this to my parents. That same night, I went ahead to my room and decided to call it a night. At around 2pm, I was woken with the sound of leaves being stepped on right outside the sliding door to my room. Slightly alarmed, I decided to not get worried, hoping it was just one of the dogs. So I lay back down, facing away from the door. A few seconds later, 
I saw the shadow creep up at my door. I was frozen in pure shock. Slowly turning around, I saw the figure of a man. I rushed to switch on the lamp by the side of my bed and quickly picked up my grandpa's old Carcano rifle. Trying to sound intimidating, I told the guy to get away in a rather squeamish voice. He stood there for a few seconds and then quickly pushed my sliding door to the side. Knowing full well I didn't have it in me to shoot him, I screamed for my dad as loud as I could. He continued to stare at me until my dad barged the door open and he ran into the woodland. In anger, my dad took the rifle out of my hands and started shooting into the night in hopes of one of the rounds catching him. The next morning the police were called, but could do nothing about it apart from file a report. I didn't know if it was the man from the river or not, so again I ended up saying nothing. I thought if I did, I could get an innocent man arrested. Around two weeks later, I still hadn't gotten over what had happened. On that day's paper, we saw an article titled, 18 year old boy murdered in his sleep. I translated this as best as I could from Albanian. At the bottom of the article, there was a picture of the man I saw at the river, with the same surprised expression, as if he had no idea what was going on. My parents didn't let me fully read the article, knowing it would just make me feel worse. To this day, I feel two things. Regret that I didn't pull the trigger, and guilt, knowing that if I had, that boy would still be alive today. His figure still haunts me.